There are many medications for MS, but which is the best? This publication analyzed 41 randomized controlled trials and ranked disease-modifying therapies based on their ability to prevent relapses and disability progression, and we'll take a look at their methodology and results. And remember what Will Harvey said, what is research but a blind date with knowledge? And you can look at their methodology in the notes below by taking a look at the publication yourself. My name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. So the methodology they used in this study is called a net network meta-analysis. Ideally, if you wanted to compare the effectiveness of two drugs, you would compare them in a head-to-head -head trial. Take a group of people with MS, give them either Ocrevus or Tysabri, and see who does better. Of course, there are so many drugs, it would be impossible to compare every drug to every other drug. You simply wouldn't be able to get the funding and recruit enough people into these studies. And so here, some of the comparisons are indirect. The study I just described doesn't exist but you can see how they both perform against placebo or against other drugs and compare them indirectly. This isn't ideal, of course, but it gives us an approximation of the efficacy of different drugs. They limited their study primarily to relapsing MS, and the inclusion criteria of the studies they looked at is at least 75% had to have relapsing MS. Many of these studies also include active secondary progressive MS, people with SPMS who have relapses. Now, of course, there are a lot of medications that have been used for MS, a lot of off-label therapies, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, but they only looked at FDA and EMA-approved drugs as of June 2022 to limit the search and just limit the complexity of the study. They looked at a couple of different outcomes. One thing was relapses. This is annualized relapse rate, relapses per person per year. For instance, if you have an ARR of 0.2, that means one relapse every five years on average. They also looked at disability progression, and they looked at what is called three-month and six-month confirmed disability progression. Now, when we measure disability with the EDSS or Expanded Disability Status Score in research, I have a separate video explaining the EDSS if you want to take a look at that. There's a lot of fluctuation, day-to-day uh, -day variation in symptoms, just fluctuation in how the examiner rates the symptom or rates the exam. So if someone gets a little worse and then they get a little bit better, it maybe wasn't a real progression or maybe it was a mild relapse that didn't really affect the long-term prognosis of the disease. But if someone gets worse and then they're examined three months or six months later and they're still worse, that suggests that there was a true worsening of disability. So three months confirmed disability progression means they were evaluated again three months later and they were still worse and six month confirmed Confirm disability progression, of course, means they were evaluated six months later and they still had not recovered. So they originally reviewed 93 studies from 728 publications, but not all of them met the inclusion criteria. So they only ended up analyzing 41 studies in the network meta-analysis. Not all of them had all of the outcomes they sought to measure. Most of them, 39 out of 41, had annualized relapse rate, again, relapses per person per year. And of of course, some studies focused on three-month confirmed disability progression. Others focused on six-month confirmed disability progression. For instance, for the CARE MS 1 and 2 studies on Lemtrada, they focused on six-month confirmed disability progression, but the researchers were able to get the raw data and infer three-month confirmed disability progression, so they did the best they could. Now, the definitions of disability progression are actually slightly different in the different studies. I won't get into the technicalities. It's quite trivial, but they did a separate analysis, one looking at the original definition of the study, and the second, they created a standardized definition, which is, of course, better for comparing different studies. So we'll focus primarily on that. This is a list of the different drugs analyzed in this study, and this is the first network. This is the network for annualized relapse rate relapses, and you can see a lot of the studies are against placebo, PBS in the center, for example, cladribine or mavenclad against placebo in the 
clarity study, but a lot of drugs had an active comparator. In other words, a head-to-head -head randomized trial against another active drug, for instance, Ocrevus versus interferon beta 1A or Rebif in the OPERA 1 and 2 studies. And I actually had some patients as a fellow in this study or alemtuzumab lintrata in the CARE MS1 and CARE MS2 trials, again against Rebif. So these drugs, Lemtrada and Ocrevus, were not compared head to head, but you can see indirectly how effective they are based on how they did versus Rebif. You can see in modern trials, a lot of drugs are compared against Abagio or teraflunamide 14 milligrams, such as Ofatumumab or Casimpta in the Asclepios 1 and 2 trials, or Ublituximab Briumbi in the Ultimate 1 or 2 trials. Now, I'll show the results on the next slide, but I want to show a snapshot of the algorithm used to create this data, and I'm not going to pretend that I understand this. Perhaps if I did, I would be on a yacht somewhere and not getting paged at 2 a.m. when someone has a stroke, but the point I'm trying to make is this is not clean data. These these are not head-to-head -head trials. These are indirect comparisons using a complicated algorithm to uh, approximate relative efficacy. So again, take the results with a grain of salt. But anyway, these are the rankings for disease-modifying therapies versus placebo. So the number you see on the right is the relative risk. So at the very top is alemtuzumab, Lemtrada, which has a 0.28 relative risk of relapses. In other words, a 72% reduction in the risk of relapses versus placebo. Again, this drug was not studied again against placebo. It was thought to be a very strong drug. It was thought that it better beat an active comparator, Rebif, if it's going to be used on the market, given the risk of immunosuppression and secondary autoimmune disease. So this is a number derived sort of arbitrarily based on the algorithm I showed you earlier approximate efficacy versus placebo. I have everything color-coded below, but I'll try to read the generic name and the trade name. So alemtuzumab, lemtrada, afatumumab, casimpta coming in second at 0 0.30 relative risk or 70% reduction in relapses, ublituximab, briumbi, natalizumab, tysabri, ocrevus or ocrelizumab, fingolimod, gelenia, Cladribine or Mavenclad, 0.42 relative risk, 58% reduction in relapses. Ozonamod, Ponisimod, Ponvori, Dimethofumarate, Tecfidera, 50% reduction in relapses. Glutirimer acetate, Copaxone, Glutopa, 20 milligram daily dose, 0.64 relative risk, only 36% reduction in relapses. Interferon beta 1b, the high dose, 44 micrograms subcutaneous three times a week. Glutirimer acetate, the 40 milligram three time a week dose. Teraflunamide or Abagio, the high dose, 14 milligrams. Interferon beta 1a, Rebif, the low dose, 22 micrograms. Interferon beta 1b, subcutaneous, in other words, Extavia or uh, beta seron and interferon beta-1,8 intramuscular, in other words, Avinex, and the low dose of teraflunamide or Abagio, 7 milligrams at a 0.79 relative risk, in other words, only 21% reduction in relapses. Next, we move to the network analysis for three-month confirmed disability progression. In other words, someone worsens, and then three months later, they're still worse, implying that they've had an actual progression event. You can see a lot of the studies are the same here. You know, Natalizumab or Tysabri versus placebo, the Affirm study, Fingolimod or uh, Gelenia versus placebo in the Freedom studies, and versus Avinex or Interferon Beta 1A in the Transforms trial. And these are the results. Now, I'm going to skip this quickly. This is as defined by the individual trial, and I'll move quickly to as defined by the standard definition, more accurate and more fair in my opinion. Although, if I flip back and forth, you can see there aren't huge differences. So the top spot is now Ocrevus with a relative risk of 0.4. So a 60% reduced risk of three-month confirmed disability progression. 
pretty good if you ask me. Very close behind is Ofatumumab or Casimta and Lemtrada with a relative risk of 0.44, a reduction of 56%, is about the same. And so you're probably taking additional risk with Lemtrada with the risk of more infections and secondary autoimmune disease in the short run. But perhaps there's the appeal of not having to take it long term, maybe making it somewhat less risky in real life in the very long term. Next is natalizumab or Tysabri. Ponvori, Panisamod, Ublituximab, Briumbi, you can see a huge confidence in interval, not even statistically significant. Dimethylfumarate or Tecfidera, Cladribine or Mavenclad, the high dose of beta interferon 1A subcutaneous, in other words, Rebif, the high dose of teraflunamide or Abagio, 14 milligrams. Now the lower dose of interferon beta 1A, 22 micrograms only 0.71 relative risk, in other words, 29% reduction in disability progression. Not a huge difference, but about the same as Jelenia, Fingolimod, 0.73, or only 27% reduction in disability progression versus placebo. Azonimod, or Zaposia, you can see it overlaps one, not even statistically significant. The low dose, daily dose of copaxone, glutyrum, or acetate, 20 milligrams, beta seron or extavia interferon beta 1a subcutaneous, Avenex interferon beta 1a intramuscular. You can see a relative risk of 0.81, not even statistically significant, 19% reduction in disability progression, and the low dose of teraflunamide or Abagio, 7 milligrams. Finally, we move to six month confirmed disability progression. In other words, this means someone gets worse and six months later, they're still worse. And I actually think this is better than three month confirmed disability progression. You never know, there could be temporary variation based on a mild relapse or even seasonal variation. I think if you're still worse six months later, that's even more meaningful. And you can see more of the modern trials look at this outcome. And I think we're going to see more and more trials compared against teraflunamide or Abagio 14 milligrams. Simply because it's a once a day pill, it's easier to get people to agree to a study where if they get randomized to the undesired drug, in other words, the older drug, at least it's just a one once a day pill that's relatively well tolerated for most people, even if it's not highly effective. But anyway, here are the results. I'll briefly flash the results based on a disability progression as defined in the original trials. Again, I think it's more accurate to look at a standard definition. Now, alimtuzumab or Lemtrada takes the top spot, relative risk of 0.43. In other words, 57% reduction in six month disability progression. Again, this is an indirect comparison. The drug was actually studied against Rebif and Rebif was studied against placebo. So it's a little bit of fuzzy math here. So take this number again with a grain of salt. Tysabri or natalizumab, 0.46. Ofatumumab or Casimta, 0.48, Ocrevus or Ublituximab, Briumvi, Cladribine, Mavenclad. One thing I note is that there really aren't huge differences between these higher efficacy medications, so it's unlikely there are major differences in their efficacy in preventing disability progression. So it makes more sense to choose a medication based on convenience, potential side effects, that kind of thing, because there probably aren't big differences in their efficacy for this outcome. Cladribine, Mavenclad, Ponisamod, Ponvery, Fingolimod, Gelenia, Dimethylfumarate, and you can see only a relative risk here of 0.68, in other words, 32%, or roughly a third reduction in six-month confirmed disability progression. Not a huge difference, but there is something there. Here, interferon beta 1A intramuscular Avenex sort of jumps the other interferons. This isn't really plausible. A low dose, low efficacy beta interferon shouldn't be better than Rebif, which is actually the same drug given more frequently. But sometimes there can be some random variation in trials. Abagio teraflunamide, 14 milligrams. Glutyrum or acetate, 20 milligrams daily. You can see not statistically significant, 0.79 relative risk, which would only be a 21% reduction. The high dose of Rebif, 
the low dose of teraflutamide or Abagio 7 milligrams. And you can see Azanamod Zaposia didn't even do better at all than placebo. You can see 1.01 relative risk, and those are the results. And despite all the caveats I've given, I do think the general trend is roughly accurate. Clearly, you can see the stronger, higher efficacy medications being towards the top of these lists in terms of prevention of disability progression and relapses. I'd love to know your own experiences. If you've taken these drugs, have they actually stopped relapses and progression of disability over the long run? And do you have suggestions for future videos?